Hello and welcome to this episode of the Big Apples Core podcast. I'm Courtney Grill, a business development director at Skanska USA Building. And today we have with us Gabby Rubin DeVoe, a senior vice president and global head of real estate and workplace. It's a mouthful, I know. <laughs> at, at iCapital. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. Um, so we have a lot to talk about today. Okay, um, let's get first thing I wanted to talk about was um, you started a, your career as an event producer at MTV um, and then parlayed that skill set to corporate real estate when your office at American Idol was undertaking an expansion and renovation. Um, and you raised your hand for that project. Yeah, I mean, you, you practically have my resume, so I don't even need to be here. You know everything. <laughs> yes, that's right. Um, I had a, a boss and a mentor who always told me to dare to be great and to raise your hand and you know, you'll rise to the occasion. So when that opportunity presented itself, I did exactly that. And I realized quite quickly that it was the same skill set. Right? It's all about timing and people and budgets, and I'm sure that can transfer into a lot of different sectors. But I loved it. It was immediately I was drawn to it. So I never looked back. That's awesome. Um, and how, uh, how did your career take you to kind of where you are today, overseeing a global portfolio? Uh, you know, that's an interesting question. I think it just, from American Idol, then we... We opened up a couple of offices, and then from there, the chairman of that company had a bunch of other companies, and because I guess I was a disruptor back then because I was challenging the architect. I'm like, why are you putting a curved wall in the pantry? We won't be able to put a shelf up there. And he complained, and I was called into his office, and I thought I was being fired, and instead he told me that he liked my moxie, and he wanted me to do this for all of his other companies. So I guess that was the biggest next step and then uh yeah so I worked with him and his companies until BuzzFeed came knocking that's awesome and can you tell us about that experience with when BuzzFeed came knocking I know you're um it's such an innovative space um yeah BuzzFeed was interesting they came and approached me all right now I'm gonna make me see if my resume if I can (laughs) quote my resume properly to 2015 in 2015, um, a recruiter reached out to me, and again, I was like, oh, this is a really interesting opportunity. I know BuzzFeed. They were growing, and so I, it was, the timing was great. So I went over there, and they were growing at such a rapid pace that they were just putting people into co-working. And so I had to sort of right-size the portfolio these guys can stay in the co-working, this, they we're paying way too much money, and sort of did an audit on the portfolio. And just at the time I started, they had acquired the 200,000 square foot space on Park Ave South. And they were like, oh, and while you're doing all of that, we need this fitted out and we have a hard out one year from today. So I was like, all right, that's great. Let's, that's an let's, aggressive let's, schedule. Yeah. So I was like, I, I like a hard deadline. I guess we're going to go for it. Uh, and we did. I'll never forget my boss at the time at my one-year review said, oh, we have to schedule your, your review. And I reminded him that we were standing in it. And that was that. Um, so yeah, we, uh, I think in the first year, uh, it was something like, 12 leases and offices, the 200,000 square foot fit out. That's a lot. Um, yeah. So it was moving at 1,000 miles an hour. Yeah. And it's one of the things I love about uh, the company I'm at now, iCapital, is we're also on that same sort of trajectory. And I love an opportunity to kind of roll up the sleeves and get to work. It's exciting. Some people might I love run that. away from I that. I love that too. So I can totally relate um, Being going a million miles an hour. I feel like I'm... More. Yeah, body motion stays in motion. Yeah, I totally exactly. appreciate that. Days go fast, and you know, by the time it's uh, you look back, you're like, "Wow, we got a lot done this year." That's amazing. Yeah, it's true. And you also had some very innovative um, spaces inside that BuzzFeed New York City um, project when you worked on it, um, and very intentional spaces. 
Oh, yes. Um, can you talk about some of those intentional spaces? Um, I know you, there was a lot of thought put into um, where kitchens and stairways and bathrooms were placed. Yeah, when you have a multi-stack office and we had floors 11 through 16 and you have to be clever and smart to make sure that people don't become siloed on all those floors. And these were people who created content, so very creative. And people automatically assume that you should put your commissary, whatever you want to call that, we called ours the canteen. And you would assume that like, oh, we're gonna put it on the top floor. And I said, no, let's put it in the middle of the stack. Right, so you have people to come up, mm -hmm. people to come down. It was also right off of the roof deck. So it made a lot of sense to me to sort of have that be the centralized location where really no offices were and people sat. Um, and the intentional inconvenience that I like to create is I said, let's commandeer 9,000 square feet for this space, this canteen, and then just put small little like against the wall pantries that just had a refrigerator for your lunches, a coffee machine and a water machine. But all the good snacks, the microwaves and everything else lived on the canteen floor. And so I got a lot of pushback, but like, well, people have to walk three flights. I'm like, right, but imagine all the casual collisions that'll happen on this staircase, mm -hmm. right? And also we kind of finessed it by saying, did you know if you went up and down to the canteen twice in one day, you walked a half a mile? So like little things like that. That's awesome made it work and right. you know, and then of course I prayed that I was right that it would work but my um the you know like I don't know the high ups right. were concerned that it would be an empty space during the day which I totally get but truth of the matter is unless you had like if we were going to have a conversation a one-on-one -on -one meeting as long right. as it wasn't proprietary or didn't require AV there was no reason why you couldn't just meet and work there or just get up from your desk and work there because you wanted to bump into people, see people. So it was always very busy. Um, and the best part about it was that the furniture there was able to, like the tables were able to uh, flip, nest, and roll away. Oh, so amazing. we were able to create different types of venues. We hosted a lot of things. They did a lot of videos, which is, you know, creating content. So they were like, yeah, let's clear the space and explode a watermelon. I'm like, sure. <laughs> Let's do that. Um, and, uh, and I think it was one of the highest viewed uh, videos they had. But um, yeah, so I felt very validated. I was a little bit nervous, but you just kind of kind of stay in the pocket and right. just hope that what you're thinking is right and that it works. And unfortunately, it. it did. Yeah, that's great. That's awesome. And it's a beautiful staircase. If you uh, there's pictures I know floating around the internet of this staircase. Um, so take a look if you've not seen it yet. Yeah, we were able to, so underneath each landing, we put um, light bulbs. And to me, it was an homage to the old subway stations. I was born and raised New Yorker. I remember back in the day when they would just be just the, uh, just the single light bulbs floating around in the ceiling there. And so, of course, we did it so that you can change the colors. So when Prince passed away, we lit up the whole staircase in different shades of purple. Oh, that's awesome. At Pride, we would do each landing would be each color of the rainbow. And it just looked beautiful because the staircase hugged the windows. That's awesome. So anybody across the way would be able to see this rainbow stack of multi-floors. And it was very cool. That is really neat. That is really awesome. Um, so you've been you've also been a great resource to many people in similar roles in the corporate real estate um, industry and in workplace positions um, within companies across all sectors. Um, please tell us, have you ever had any mentors or individuals who've been impactful to your career? I know you mentioned a hundred percent, and I'm not even sure like who might have said that about me, but that <laughs> I appreciate that. But of course, uh, I think it's really important that everybody have a mentor and then maybe you know pay it forward or back, whichever way you want to look at it, and be a mentor if you have the opportunity to as well. Um, my first job um, at MTV, my boss there, Christina Norman, who is awesome, and she was an amazing mentor. Taught me so much and you know, that was <laughs> one of the, she was the one who told me to, you know, dare to be great and raise your hand and, you know, bite off more than you can chew and mm -hmm. just trust yourself that you'll do it. Uh, and then when I, when I was at BuzzFeed and people told me, oh, you should join 
cornet, I was like, I don't know much about it. And then I met Lee Kozmak, and I just loved her. From the moment I met her, I thought she was great. And I wanted to start my own SIG, which is what they used to call it back in the day, right? right. The special interest group. And at the time, they had the Tammy SIG, the Law SIG. Mm -hmm. you know, and, I remember that. And me being at BuzzFeed, I, I just really didn't find my peeps as an end user. Um, the Tammy SIGs had groups in there like Sony and BlackRock and all these big companies that were well established. And here are, I was part of this unicorn enterprise startup. And I'm like, where are my peeps? You know, where are the companies like LinkedIn and Google and all these other uh, companies? And so Lee was one of the people who said, if you know them, bring them. <laughs> so uh, I had this event at BuzzFeed and I just, on LinkedIn, anybody who had any sort of uh, words in their titles like real estate or facilities, which was kind of what people were using then. Now we use workplace a lot more. Right. Um, I invited them and then uh, started that SIG. And I think at one point we had like 38 members. We had more than any other uh, SIG at the time. And Lee was just great all through, you know, since then and still is uh, someone I always reach out to when I was contemplating leaving my last job to go to iCapital. She was great and instrumental and in, like, ask these questions, you know, make sure that they do this and whatever. And I think it's really important to have a soundboard to bounce things off of. Um, and just the same, I also think it's really important to have an advocate in your Absolutely. company too, right? So mentors and advocates are different. Yes. Um, so I think they're both really important people to have in your lives. And I, um, I understand that a lot of you still connect on a regular basis. Yes. Um, a lot of these people, a lot of the other end users that were in these SIGs, um, and you talk regularly, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, we have a WhatsApp group that I started. That We did that during COVID when we couldn't get together anymore. Uh, and, and it's just been great because, you know, you get an instant response. If someone says, um, hey, does anybody know we can do testing on site for COVID? All of a sudden, ping, 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 ping. Everybody's got somebody uh, and some answer for you. So it's great. It's really important to have people in the industry to lean on. And I think that's really important you know we shouldn't be competing with each other right we should be right. helping each other out and uh sharing those sort of best practices absolutely especially um because you're in similar roles but just across all different companies and sectors so that's a great resource to have um since you don't typically not everybody has the same similar peers within their workplace i had um i had a friend of mine tell me she was like, you got to look at it through the lens that, right, um, this might not be your last role. This might not be their last role. And so there's no reason to kind of hold the cards to the vest, share those best practices, help each other out. And I've always subscribed to that since then. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I always, I always tell people on my team, I was like, you should always keep your resume updated. And you should... You know, anytime those opportunities come up, like, you know, it, it's good and healthy to have conversations uh, and just kind of test those waters a little bit. Absolutely. You know? And learn from one another. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's okay. It's uh, Create you know. better efficiencies. hundred <laughs> percent. Especially when you have to deliver a project uh, on a short time frame. I'm sure that comes in handy. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's also the same like, oh, does anybody have uh, an architect in uh, Brussels? And, you know, oh, yeah, I know three. I'm like, oh, I have a couple. Yeah, of course, you know. <laughs> so you guys can, you know, everybody should help everybody, you know, lift up a little bit. That's awesome. That's great. Um, is there something that you hope to be able to contribute or message to others in similar positions as you? I just really, I'm one of the things I really – really try is to remind myself that, and this is true for everybody in whatever you do, is to trust that you are the expert. It's very easy to have outside voices kind of come in, you know, and when I say that, I mean like within your company and stuff, um, but to maintain those convictions and, and sell it to them, right? Often, you know, people will tell me <coughs> it could be, um, someone higher up will say like, oh, we want to do this or that. And then you're like, well, I don't think that's a great idea. <laughs> and sometimes people will just 
go with it because you know they're higher than you and they're you know um but other times i think like you know to challenge it in the best way possible and if you are because ultimately you're going to have to kind of deal with it anyway right so you know be strong enough and, and trust yourself enough that you know what you're doing and why this is the right thing, i.e. like what I did, say, with the canteen, right? right? They could have been like, no, 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 we want a pantry on every floor. And I can understand why they think that my idea was horrible and that makes a lot more sense, but then I sort of sold it to them about you know wanting people to see each other, not being siloed on each floor, right. and then I got them to come around and then I prayed <laughs> what my contentions were were actually correct. And thank goodness they were. Right. Um, but I, I think that's a much better way to 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 work than the other way around. Absolutely. And I mean, and that project was completed in... Um, we finished it in 2016. We had that right. one year. Um, and, you know, in a post-COVID world where people are returning back to the workplace, um, that's so important to have, I mean, to have a space like that that forces people to circulate, to see one another, to collaborate. It's a different world now, right? I mean, what used to entice people to come to the office, right? You can bring your dogs to the office and we have snacks is irrelevant now. Like, yeah, I have snacks and my dog at home, right? Um, so now it, for the people in workplace, we were faced with a challenge that we're completely uncharted territory. And that was a great thing having this, you know, my group. Right. Is that, what are you doing? Are you testing in the lobby? What are you doing to bring people back? How are you enticing them? Are you sending them stuff at home? Or are you trying to bring them back? And we all sort of like threw ideas up against the wall and you had to try on some different things. And it's not a one size fits all. Every industry and every company is different. But at the end of the day, there's an unquantifiable value of being in person. Right. Right, because if I bump into you, I might not have sent you an email. It probably didn't even warrant a Slack. But if I see you, I'll be like, oh, Courtney, I want to ask you. Da, 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 da. And then, you know, you can have a, a like, micro meetings throughout the day. And I think it's, you don't know what you don't know. Right, absolutely. So what's going to entice people to come into your office? And it might not be all the kitschy stuff we used to put in the office. Completely. Right? I might just kind of compete with your home office. If I give you a better setup than what you have at home, maybe you're going to want to work like that well sometimes it's so much more efficient like today i was able to get 10 things done in a fraction of the time because i didn't have to schedule a meeting i didn't have to pick up the phone and call somebody and see if they were in a meeting or available to talk um i just had a natural conversation in the office right when i ran into them um so that that is a great reason to be back in the in the work it's nice to see people i mean you know, we're social people. I mean, Absolutely. that we're you know, wired to interact and to be around people. So it's it, there's something nice about it. I know for myself, I'm like, I miss my clothes, right? <laughs> but like, when you're like, I want to get up and like get into a routine. And the, that line was very gray, right? Because at first, we were all enamored with that. Right. Right? Like, oh, my God, I can start working at 7. And because I have people over in Asia, it makes a lot of sense. And I can start working then. And I don't have to waste time on a commute. And all that, but then the lines became very blurred when I'm like, when do I stop working? I want to stop and like have dinner with my kids, but then I'm going to go back to work. Am I not going to go work? And so now it's like, you know, it's, it's very clear. Um, and I saw Jason Astor uh, not too long ago. We had lunch and he made a comment. I'm going to <laughs> regurgitate it right now. Thanks, Jason. He said there's a social contract in, with New York, which I totally get, right? Yeah. If I'm out of my house... After work, I might go meet up with somebody for a drink or go to dinner or go to the gym, you know? Right. And so it's so nice to see where companies are, whether they're mandating people to come back to the office, people are electing to come back to the office. It's not just the office. It's everything else that's also then picks up with it. And so it's really nice to see. I never stopped going to the office, and I used to bike to the office, literally I've taken pictures where I am the only person on the viaduct around Park Avenue, which is normally like bumper to bumper. Right. And I'm literally on the viaduct with nobody behind me and I'm taking a picture. I'm like, this is scary. It's like apocalyptic. That's pretty cool though. So it's really nice now to see the flow of everything sort of coming back. Absolutely. 
and all the lunch and restaurant places I mean. opening again, Absolutely. and they're crowded and busy and buzzing. It's exciting. Right. Anybody who wrote off, uh, you know, come back to work in New York, then they don't know New York. I agree. I agree. It's, it's, it's as exciting as it ever was. Absolutely. Um, so you've also been a huge champion for diversity, equity, and inclusion when it's in our industry. What change have you seen in the last several years, and how long do you think it will get to where we need to be as an industry? I think it's constantly evolving, right? I think whatever definition people had of diversity, I don't even want to put a number on how many years ago, is different than than where it is today, right? Um, and I think it's it's really important, and I think a lot of companies now have that vertical within their organization, right? Somebody who does D E and I. Um, and what does that look like? And I think, you know, it, it's important to kind of like keep testing and pushing that. Um, I did a, a webinar, and I was, <laughs> I've been trying to get my hands on it ever since, quite actually. Um, but it was all about like, being biased, right? And what I learned from it, and something I took away, I'm like, wow. When I said, oh, I have a lot of women on my team. I, you know, I want to, I want to hire a guy. You think that's being, you know, diversified, right? And it's not. It's being biased. See, Interesting. Your face tells me that you didn't know that either. Yeah, I had no idea. Right? And they're like, because you got to hire the best candidate. And if it happens to be a woman for this particular role, then so be it. So, yeah, I, I think the more that we continue to open our eyes, the more our eyes get opened, right? Like, Absolutely. You got to, you got to, you know, kind of be open to everything. And it's not just your definition of what diversity is, right? There was something else I did um, called high and low context cultures. Mm -hmm. um, because it's really important if I'm on a global scale, on a, right. you know, and a lot of people are, you have to know what different cultures, you know, how they function and how they work, right? Right. We are very high context, right? I'm gonna see, I'm gonna ask how your weekend was in the meeting before I leave. We're gonna talk about our action items. After the meeting, I'm gonna memorialize it in an email. It's like we're over right. with the context, right? It's so much. Other cultures are not like that, but if you didn't know that, you might take offense to it or take it personally or not understand. Absolutely. So yeah, there's a, you know, it's a very wide spectrum. That's interesting. And how does that high and low context play into, does it play in at all to how you space plan um, for your various sites globally at all? Well, whereas I said to like kind of stay in the pocket and, and stand in your convictions about like what you think is right, I also know that I don't know everything. And so when it comes to different cultures in, in different countries, I'm not just going to, you know, take this and then we're gonna plug it in here and take this and plug it in there. You have to be open to what, you know, I mean, we have a certain standards on our aesthetics. Um, and I think this probably plays more into the culture than to the physical space. Like when we do say happy hours, right? What we might do here in the States is gonna be very different maybe in Lisbon, right? right. And then very different than what we would do in Singapore. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be open to have some of that fluidity come in with like the concept, like at the end of the day, we just want to get people together and socialize, and and so it doesn't really matter if like if you're more likely to do a lunch instead of a happy hour, if you're more likely to, you know, I don't know, whatever, you know, can't think of a good example right now, but you have to be open to having each culture and each country and each you know city, whatever that might be, do their thing. That makes sense. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so there was a recent article referencing iCapital hiring new employees across your portfolio in a time where many tech employees are being laid off. Um, how is iCapital strategizing for growth? Uh, you know, I, I think, when, especially when it comes to real estate, if we're talking in, in that capacity, I think that has never changed, right? As much as we talked about COVID, I saw a lot of companies sort of downsize. And I was like, wow, I think they're being overzealous. I do think that it might take some time, a couple of years, but we will bounce back. And so, you know, that's always the game when it comes to real estate. Like, how much do we need? We can only forecast for so long, for so far. Um, and, you know, when you, when you take on a lease in a lot of space, of course you don't fill it up day one. 
Um, and so there's always that puzzle, right? I, I usually say that like somewhere in the middle of your term is when you hit that sweet spot, right? Where it's right. like, we still have room for growth. We're not too, too packed. Um, and you don't want it to, the space to be too empty. So like, that's always the dance. I, but I don't think that that has changed. I think that you account and you do your best to think about where we're going, what we're doing, what we're trying to accomplish, and then and and then find the amount of space that works with that plan. I know that was kind of a little bit all over the place, but <laughs> I think you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's um, it's hard. You know, let's say you have a hundred employees, you're not going to get a space for like. 110 employees and you know 500 great if that's your trajectory right um but i always say i i think it's always better to have more space than not enough mm -hmm. right because maybe you can sublease it or you know it, it's worse to have or i mean if you don't take enough there are things that we can do also right people right. do uh neighborhooding people do hoteling um and every company is different in how they handle that absolutely um, are there some aspects or to the office that you've found specific to iCapital or fintech in general, um, as opposed to some of the other sectors that you've worked in? Um, this is my first time working in a, the, the fintech industry. Um, now that I think about it, when I look back at my career, I've always been in, uh, I guess, media-related sort of companies, right, between MTV and I am... I, an idol and um yeah they were and then buzzfeed right they all sort of created content and mm -hmm. said so this is different but i think at the end of the day it, it really comes down to people and that's that remains the same that's true. right and i think that what you do for one company is not like oh that worked so well so i'm gonna just plug it in in this company no you have to know your culture you have to know your brand there's no point of putting in like open collaborative seating if people are somewhat tethered to their desks, right. right? So you have to know how people work. And then there are clever ways of which that you can sort of put different things on different floors to get them moving, right? But, um, you know, it, you don't just like throw nap rooms in just for the hell of it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever used those anyway. <laughs> Who wants to be busted like coming out of a nap room? You know? <laughs> Uh, sorry, boss. Awkward. I was just taking a snooze. I was out late last night. Um, yeah, that's like when like I jumped the shark as far as I was concerned. <laughs> uh, that is true. Um, all right, switching topics a little bit. All right. In addition to your career in corporate real estate, you're also a wife, mother, an avid martial artist, um, and you have uh, your female awareness instructor. Yes. Um, who teaches self-defense classes. Uh, first, how do you find time to balance it all? Again, I told you, a body motion stays in motion. <laughs> I'm a Gemini, so I, so am I like to... All right, so you can understand. I can understand that. You know, I like to try on a lot of things. I, you know, um, I was a DJ, and I used to do that after work at MTV, and I, and I DJed a lot of the MTV um, events, and that was super fun. Um, but you know, I'm, so I'm always doing something, right? We talked about this necklace. I'm like, oh, I'm designing jewelry right now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I try my hand at a lot of different things. But yeah, I parlayed my martial arts uh, into, and I didn't mean to monetize it. It somewhat happened organically, which is, I think, like when you're open to things, and this is like the Zen in me. Mm -hmm. Just be open. Is if you're open, kind of things will you'll come and it's a matter it's up to you whether you notice that and capitalize on that moment right um and so this company sort of happened organically my mom's um my mom's a real estate broker and one of her friends was unfortunately attacked at an open house and i ended up grabbing my mom and her friend and having this impromptu class and what i was teaching them was just like hey maybe tip the doorman twenty dollars so that they can check names instead of just being like oh yeah open house is penthouse right and they send them right up right uh, i said or bring a junior broker and mentor them um or you can put those alarm you know those little door stoppers that are yeah. alarms put that in and then like wedge the front door open let them come in in front of you and you're always behind them like all these things and then i realized whether they thought i was going to teach them self-defense of just like physical techniques right the truth of the matter is attacks begin before it's physical. And that's what's missing from a lot of self-defense classes is they start from the moment that somebody already has their hands on you. Like, all right, guy's got you in a headlock. 
Well, yeah, great. Well, how do you learn to avoid that? And that's what I started to teach. And so my class is a one-off. It's two hours. And, uh, you know, it, it's good. It feels good to sort of pay it forward. Yeah, I've, I've been through your class twice now, um, <laughs> once through Cornet and once with my running team. And right. it's, um, it's a great class. It's so helpful. And it's funny, which is a lot of things people think is like kind of ironic that I would mix humor with a very serious topic. I feel like it hold, that's, it helps people, like it holds people's attention and they're going to remember it though. Yeah, I don't think scaring people inspires them at all. So, <laughs> and look, I mean, black belts aside, I find myself in susceptible situations too. So I kind of share those stories and be like, right, which girl hasn't made that phone call while she's walking down the street and like, I'm walking now, keep me company. Right? right, and in reality, it seems like a good idea, but it's not. Right, because I can't hear you, I can't see you, and for all these reasons, I think by illustrating those types of um, situations, then people can relate. Absolutely, um, and it's just useful, practical tips um, yeah. that you can just apply anytime, especially living in this city. Yeah. Um, so, second, your career in global corporate real estate um, has has your Female awareness and instruction influenced each other at all? No, they really they don't intersect whatsoever. I think that they're very different. Look, I think th the one thing that is common is my motto in life, and I say this to my team all the time, be ahead of it. In workplace, like the worst thing is someone's like, hey, um, you know, this is um, the bevy machine's out. It's like, no, how do we be ahead of it so we don't get those tickets? Right. And I think about it also like when it comes to right. martial arts or to be ahead of a situation. Right. If I'm not looking at my phone when I'm walking down the street, but I'm looking straight ahead. If I see something that doesn't seem right, I have time to be ahead of it and cross the street or duck in someplace. Absolutely. Right. So that is the one thing that I think um, they kind of intersect. Absolutely. That does intersect that way. Um, so we also end each segment with something called the New York Minute. Okay. Um, so rapid fire questions. All right, hit me. Uh, what's your favorite way to get around the city? Oh, I sit a bike everywhere. Amazing. I used to have a Vespa, which I loved, but you know, kids, eh, that's, nah, that's gone. Absolutely. What's your favorite lunch spot? La Pecora Bianca, and I love it because oh, it was at my great. last, right? And then they just opened up at Bryan Park. So I'm like, oh my God, they're following me. I love them so much. And their food is so, so good. It's so good. It's amazing. Um, if you could go back and tell your 18 year old self one thing, what would you say? Um, that's funny. That's interesting. I don't know that, um, just be open to everything because it's going to be a very interesting ride. That, I, that's, that's great. Um, also you're super active with your kids. What's one of your favorite spots to take them? Oh gosh. I mean, we love to go everywhere. I think, I don't know. We love... We love the beach. We're definitely beach people. We just came back from the Bahamas, that and uh, my daughter learned to snorkel. And next thing I knew, we were snorkeling a, a shipwreck, and she thought it was the Titanic. So you know, we always like to experience new things. So we very rarely sort of repeat, but the beach is a commonality, and that's a theme for us. We're Absolutely, always, and yeah. it's definitely a great place to go this time of year when it's like thirty-five degrees again <laughs> in New York City. Absolutely. Um, and then last question: What's one interesting fact about yourself? Oh gosh. Uh, I used to do stand-up comedy. That's awesome. Oh. Right. That's cool. It was it was one of those things that people are like you're funny. You should do stand-up comedy. I'm like okay, so I did after school when I was like first out of college and I was a PA like in film because I thought I was going to be in the film industry, right? And, right. And make movies and things like that. And I realized I hated that industry. It wasn't for me because I needed more instant gratification, which is why I ended up segueing into MTV because it was TV. It was live. It was in the studio. Uh, it was scripted. It was, you know, like reality. So I liked all of that. And the film world for me, I was like, I, I, there's no interaction. Um, but while I was doing that, I tried my hand at stand-up comedy. And it was very interesting. At the end of the day, like, it was fun, but it was just something to do for a certain time in my life and thank goodness That's awesome like this is how old I am like everything's on VHS so nobody can find any of my comedy <laughs> <laughs> it'd be awesome if we could but no not for me it wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> that is awesome though um well that wraps up this uh episode of the Big Apples Corp podcast it. Thank you for listening, and we thank Steelcase for hosting us today. Thank you so much.